Good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on where you are. And thank you for having me here on the Rapid Exchange Forum. Uh, we're going to talk today about the false debate, the false controversy that's been arising between the use of drugs for COVID-19 instead of vaccines. I, unlike most of you, am not an expert in public health, but I am an expert in science communication. I have been working in communicating science to the public and to policymakers for quite some time in Brazil, where I run the only NGO, the only non-profit organization devoted to the promotion of science-based public policies. And anti-science movements like the anti-vaccine movement, they have strategies that are very common to these movements. And one of these strategies is the false debate, creating a false controversy and exploring it. And it's very important that to communicate science to the public and to policymakers, we expose these strategies and we are able to identify and nominate them and then we can act. So what's it, what, what is it? with the false debate. The false debate treats COVID as a mild disease. So uh, COVID could drive us to herd immunity. There are very few people who actually die from the disease. And look, there's a cure. There are drugs for COVID-19. So you don't really need vaccines. This is the false controversy, as if it were a matter of choosing between treatment and prevention. And we know, of course, that it isn't. But it's very appealing sometimes to the public and to policymakers when you say, OK, so these vaccines are new. They are ex experimental vaccines. We don't know long term effects. And all these false premises that lead sometimes the public to think that, well, maybe the drugs are more reliable. Maybe they have a point. We have drugs, so we don't really need the vaccines. OK, so don't fall for that. This is a strategy of the anti-vaccine movement. And this is a very common strategy, and it is the false debate. Uh, in my country, in Brazil, we used to be the country of football, the country of samba, the country of carnival, but now we are the country of chloroquine, early treatment and denialism, thanks to my president, Jair Bolsonaro. Unfortunately, Brazil has become really engaged in choosing treatment over vaccines, and that has been ongoing during the pandemic. My president, Jair Bolsonaro, has openly questioned the validity and efficacy of vaccines and safety of vaccines, and he has been openly defending from the start of the pandemic the use of hydroxychloroquine and several other miracle drugs. So you see that it doesn't really matter if the drugs are real or if they are imaginary. The debate is false. Even if we have good drugs for COVID-19, and now we do, we do have some medications that really help, but it's not a reason to go for the medications and forget about vaccines. And this is what Bolsonaro wanted us to believe in Brazil. If we have chloroquine, why do we need vaccines? And this speech has become so strong in my country that people really believe the president and they went out on the streets to protest. And you see the signs that they hold read, we don't want vaccines, we have chloroquine. So people in Brazil really believed this false controversy, this false debate. We don't need the vaccines, we have chloroquine. Fortunately, most Brazilians are very favorable to vaccination. So Brazil wasn't really hurt by this strategy that came directly from the federal government yet. For COVID-19, I think Brazil is doing fine. We are vaccinating the population. The population wants to be vaccinated. So, so far, so good. But we don't know the long-term effects of this strategy in my country. We don't know where Brazil will be 
five years from now, 10 years from now, regarding vaccination, if this confidence that the population has on vaccines today will be damaged by this anti-vax propaganda that has been that, 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 that has been propagated really by, by the federal government themselves, by the president himself, and by the Minister of Health. So this kind of anti-vax speech generates this sentiment of a false debate. And this is what we as policymakers like yourselves, as health experts and as science communicators must be aware of. The anti-vax movement always offers an alternative. It just doesn't say, oh, vaccines are worthless, don't use vaccines. Sometimes it is as blunt as that, but it usually offers an alternative. Vaccines are not really necessary because we have XYZ. XYZ could be drugs, could be uh, a healthy lifestyle, could be vitamins and supplements, could be this book about natural health that will boost your immune system system so you don't need vaccines so you can have anything by the end of that sentence but usually you have something so vaccines are not necessary because we have or i am not against vaccines but nothing good comes after this but you can even substitute, I'm not against vaccines for, I am not a racist, I am not a homophobic, but nothing good usually comes after this but. And in the anti-vax movement, it usually says, I am not against vaccines, but vaccines were made too quickly, but we have medications. So it offers an alternative that may sound reasonable for most people. So we really have to engage with people and explain that this is a false debate. So don't fall for the false debate. It's a trap. You don't have to debate with these people if vaccines are preferable to medications. This controversy doesn't exist. So stick to well-known facts that are very easy to explain to people. Prevention is always better, cheaper, and involves less pain and risk. If you don't prevent infectious diseases, even when you have medication, people will get sick, they will need treatment, they will be in pain, they will suffer. It's, this is unnecessary. It's not vaccines that are unnecessary, but pain and suffering that can be prevented. And of course, prevention and treatment were never mutually exclusive. This is insane. You can prevent disease and treat disease, and you should be doing both, as we do for most infectious diseases. So we have a lot of infectious diseases for which we have vaccines, and still, when people get sick, we treat them. There are lots of infectious diseases caused by bacteria that we can prevent with vaccines, but eventually if people get sick, we'll give them antibiotics. So it's not mutually exclusive and people can understand it because they know what it is to take an antibiotic. They know what it is to take a vaccine and to vaccinate their children. So stick to the facts that are very well known to people. And remember that the only strong argument for stopping vaccination is eradication of disease. And we only did that once in history for smallpox. It's the only time in history where we said, okay, now we can stop vaccinating because the disease is gone. So until the disease is gone, Vaccines are the only public health strategy that will keep us from getting ill all the time with that disease. It doesn't eradicate it always, but it stops the disease from circulating. People know that. You have to appeal to people's memories. Remember what it was like. The older generations remember what it was like without vaccines, when we had polio, when we had measles. And now these diseases hardly circulate anymore. So we can and we should explain the basics 
to the people and to policymakers. And we have to expose the false debate, the false controversy that is being generated by the propagators of the anti-vax movement. Remember that we have the three C's that were developed by the SAGE group of, about vaccine hesitancy. So confidence, complacency and convenience. This is complacency. We are talking about the second C of the three Cs. So we don't really need vaccines. It's a mild disease. People don't really get that ill. It's not that serious. So we are dealing with something that we already know. It's been studied. Psychologists have studied these three Cs and we can work with that. So remind the policymakers that you have to talk to all the population about the three C's. It's very easy to explain and it's very easy to expose the movement when you do. To sum up, beware of the false equivalence that these debates generate. Be careful when you say when you say to the public that the medical community, the scientific community is divided. No. We are not divided. Anyone who is a serious medical doctor or a serious scientist know about the safety and efficacy and necessity of vaccination. So the medical community is not divided, but the false debate can generate this false equivalence. So let's have a public debate about uh, vaccines and medications, which one is better, which one we should be investing on. This is not a real debate. And we know that working with science communication, we have worked with the false debate in other anti-science movements. For instance, evolution. Evolution has always been at the fringe of anti-science movements. It has always been attacked by creationism. And a while ago, uh, Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Dawkins made an agreement that they would never debate with a creationist again because it would generate a false equivalence every time that they accepted an invitation for a debate about evolution they would generate this false equivalence that evolution and creationism would be in the same level inside the scientific community. So the scientific community would be divided and would be discussing if evolution is real or not. So it's not the case. So Dawkins and Jay Gould decided that they were not going to accept invitations to these debates anymore. And it's a very similar situation. So beware of these false debates and false equivalences. Vaccine safety and efficacy is not open for debate. We know that vaccines are safe. We know that vaccines are effective. They have been tested. And this is what we need to convey to the public. So an honest question is not the same as a deceitful rhetoric. And this rhetoric, this false rhetoric, is what we're trying to expose here when we talk to the public and when we talk to policymakers. So you see, this is a false equivalence. This is a false debate. This is not open for honest questioning because the questions have already been made and answered with clinical trials that have been conducted that attest to the safety and efficacy of the vaccines. And okay, the drugs have also been tested and they are good. We're going to use them, but there is no debate of which one is better. We need vaccines and we need drugs. It's different strategies. It's complementary strategies. We need prevention and we need treatment. And the public is perfectly capable of understanding it, but we have to expose the strategy of a movement that exists, an anti-vaccine movement. It exists, it's real, it's trying to convince people not to vaccinate, and it usually offers an alternative. We don't really need vaccines because we have. So beware of the strategy, and it's going to become easier to fight. Good science communication practices demand that honest questions must be answered with care, 
with compassion and patience. So people have honest questions about vaccines and about medication. And we have to provide the answers in a clear way, in a way that is easy to find and that is easy to understand. But we shouldn't give a platform for anti-vaxxers. We shouldn't give a platform for false rhetoric. False rhetoric is not the same as honest questions. And good science communication is going to answer all the questions, but shouldn't really listen to false rhetoric. So this is it. Uh, I hope I have helped with some science communication insights, and I hope that the other speakers can help you even more. Thank you very much.